Good evening, everyone. Um, OK, the last time we've learned about uh, four different cases of uh, LPs, which means I said every LP, every linear programming model must fall into uh, one of these four cases, right? So it should be uh, LP should have a unique optimal solution or it has alternate or multiple, actually infinite number of optimal solutions. And the third case would be the infeasible, which means the feasible region contains no points, right? And the last case would be the unbounded LPs. So in that case, there are points, the feasible region with arbitrarily very large, the objective function value for the maximization problem and arbitrarily very small objective function values for the minimization problem, right? And you've also learned about graphical method for solving the linear programming problem in which there are only two decision variables, right? And I've just briefly introduced Lindo and Lingo with a simple exercise, example problems, right? And today, I will continue to talk about Lingo. However, our discussion for today will be focused on the uses of uh, Lingo sets, okay, sets options. And just to let you know, this website provides the lots of useful information about uh, Lingo sets. So I would recommend you to visit this website and take some time to play with them, okay? Okay, before we talk about lingo sets, I want you to refresh your memory. So let's try to find an optimal solution for this RP graphically, okay? So let me give you a little time, like less than a minute. So why don't you uh, find, why don't you try to find the optimal solution? Of course, first of all, you need to determine the feasible reason, right? And then find out how many extreme points do we have and draw the isovalue line and try to move the isovalue line parallel to increase the objective function value. And the one that causing the feasible reason that will provide the optimal solution, right? So how does the feasible reason look like this problem? Okay. I believe all of you figured out the feasible reason. It's pretty simple, right? This polygon is the feasible reason for this problem, okay? And I believe if I say this is the constraint number one, number two, number three, for example. Then this is the constraint number two, and this one is the constraint number three, right? And this one is the constraint number one, right? And 
Sorry. So, of course, we do have five extreme points, right, on this feasible region. So if this RP has an optimal solution, the optimal solution should be one of these five points, right? So the first step after you recognize the feasible region is to draw the isovalue line, I said, right? So just choose any point in the feasible region and get the corresponding objective function value, Z, right? So let's choose point one zero. So with x one equals one and x two equals zero, we have z values to be three times one plus two times zero becomes three, right? Which means this point one zero lies on the isovalue line, which is g equals three x one plus two x two equals three, right? And this can be rewritten as x two equals negative three half x one minus three half, right? Is correct? Which means this line has a slope of negative three half and x two intercept of negative three half, right? And you remember all the isovalue line has the same slope, right? Because it has the form that 3x1 plus 2x2 equals constant, right? From here, right? And we know that the objective function value, g, will be increased if we move isovalue line in a direction for each both x1 and x2 increase, right? So this way x1 will be increased and this way x2 will be increased, right? Oh, we didn't even draw the isovalue line, right? Because x2 intercept is negative 1.5, right? So it's like somewhere over here, negative 1.5. And the slope is negative 3 half. So if I say this is the negative 2, then the isovalue line would be something like this, right? So we need to move this isovalue line this direction, right? Which is the northeast direction, right? Then we know that this one would be the optimal point, right? Which intersects the feasible region, okay? So the point. 4.2 provides the optimal point. Of course, the corresponding objective function value would be 3 times 4 plus 2 times 2 becomes 14. That is the objective function value. Is that right? 16? Yeah, oh, you're right. Thank you. Isn't that easy, right?
And one of the the homework number homework problem is about the this graphical method, right? So I believe everybody knows how to do this this moment, right? Okay, then let's talk about the lingo sets, okay? So compared to the lindo, the most powerful feature of lingo is its ability to model a very large systems with using sets option, okay? So lingo enables the user to create many, probably hundreds or thousands of constraints or objective function terms by typing just several lines, okay? And the key concept that provides this feature is the idea of a set of similar objects, okay? The set might be a list of products, trucks, or the peoples, okay? And each member in the set may have one or more characteristics associated with it. We call these characteristics attributes. And the attribute values can be either known in advance or unknown. In that case, the RB, the, I'm sorry, in that case, the lingo solved solve that for us, okay? So for example, each truck in a set of trucks might have a capacity at attribute. And each employee in a set of employees might have a salary attribute. Likewise, each product in a set of products might have a price attributes and so on. The sets are defined in an optional section of a lingo model, which is called the set section. And this set section begins with the keyword sets and colon and end with another keyword and sets. And the set section may appear anywhere in the mother, in the lingo mother, but there is only one restriction that you must, be you must be define a set and its attribute before they are referenced, the mother's constraints, okay? And there are two kinds of sets in lingo. They are primitive sets or the derived set, we call. A primitive set is one that contains distinct mem members. That is, it is a set composed only of objects that cannot be further reduced. To define a primitive set in a set section, you need to specify the name of the set which is a name you choose to designate the set, okay? And optionally, it's member list. Uh, there is a list of the members that, constitu that constitute the sets and any attributes the members of the set may have. So for example, this set is given the same name, trucks, okay? And contains 27 members. Which is, which is identified by TR1 dot dot TR27, okay? And in this case, the attributes for each member support the capacity, okay? That's the just general syntax for lingo sets, okay? And the derived set is defined using one or more other sets which means a derived set derives its members from other pre-existing sets. To define a derived set in a set section, you need to specify the name of the set, which is the name you choose to designate the set, and the parent set list, which is a list of previously defined sets, okay? Which is separated by commas. And optionally is member list and any attributes uh, can be uh, included. So if the member list is omitted, the derived set 
were con consist of all the combinations of the members from the parent sets, right? And when a set does not have a member list, so in that case, it contains all the possible combinations of the members. So in that case, it is referred to as being a dense set, okay? So as an example, uh, let's consider the following set sections. In this example, uh, there are four sets, right? So which one is primitive set? You remember primitive sets consist of objects that cannot be further reduced, right? So in that case, the product, machine, and weak sets are the primitive sets, right? While allowed is derived from parent sets. In this case, the parent sets are the product, machine, and weak. Is that right? So taking all the combinations of members from the three parent sets, we come up with the following members, the allowed sets, okay? So this table shows the allowed set membership. Because the member list is omitted in this case, the derived set consists of all the combinations of the members from the parent set. We have three parent sets, each with two members, right? In here. So two times two times two becomes eight. So we have total eight different combinations in this table, okay? And we say the set is sparse if a set includes a member list which limits it to being a subset of its dense form. So the sparse set contain only a subset of the cross of the parent set. And, and the sparse set may be defined by two methods, either an explicit member list or a membership filter method. Okay. And as I say, the explicit listing method involves listing the members of the sparse set, whereas the membership filter method allows the user to specify the sparse set members compactly through the use of a logical condition. All members must satisfy. Okay. So when using an explicit member list method to specify a drive set's member list, you must explicitly list all the members you want to include in the set. And like it says, each list member must be a member of the dense set formed from all the possible combinations of the parent sets. So returning to our example, if we had used an explicit member list, the definition of the allowed like this, then the allowed would not have had full complement of eight members in this case. Instead, the allowed would have consisted of the three member sparse set, which is AM1 and AN2 and BN1, right? So if you have a very large sparse set, explicitly listing all members could be tedious and time consuming, right? So fortunately, in many sparse sets, the members will satisfy some condition that differentiates them from the uh, non-members, okay? So if you could just specify this condition, you could save yourself a lot of time so this is exactly how the membership filter method works, okay? Okay, so the membership filter method of defining a derived set member list involves specifying a logical condition that each potential set member must satisfy for inclusion in the final set, okay? So in the other words, you can look at the logical condition as a filter to keep out potential members that doesn't satisfy some criteria. 
Okay, then as an example of a membership filter, suppose you have already uh, defined a set called trucks, okay? And each truck has an attribute which is called capacity. And you'd like to derive a subset from trucks that contains only those trucks capable of holding big loads, for example, 50 tons, 50,000. And by using membership filter method, this can be done easily like this. Which means you have named the set heavy underscore duty and have derived it from the parent set, which is trucks, right? Here, the vertical bar character is used to mark the beginning of a membership filter. And the membership filter allows only those trucks that has a holding capacity, which is greater than 50,000 into the heavy underscore duty set, okay? And the symbol and one in the filter is known as the set index placeholder. It's like a first, first subscript, okay? So if you have, a, for example, and the two, then this means the second subscript for each decision variable, like that. But in this example, we have only one parent set, which is truck, which means we don't have second subscript. So this end two would not have made sense, okay? The symbol sharp, GT sharp, which is this, is a logical operator, which means something is greater than something, okay? And Ringo recognize the following logical operators, equal, not equal, greater than or equal to, or greater than, less than, or less than or equal to, okay? And besides this section, Ringo provides another section, which is called the data section, okay? So in which values uh, can be defined for different variables. Typically, you will want to assign values to some, some set attributes. So for this purpose, Lingo uses the data section, okay? And the data section begins with keyword data colon and ends with and data, okay? And this data section allows you to isolate data from the rest of your model. And actually, this is very good for the maintenance of the model, okay? And in the data section, you can have statements to initialize the attributes of the sets you defined in a set section. So of course, these expressions have the syntax, okay? And the attribute list contains the names of the attributes you want to initialize. And the value list contains the values to assign to the attributes in the attribute list. Is that complicated? Okay, let's take an example for this. So this example defines values for each attribute separately. That is, we have two attributes which is X and Y, defined in the set, set one, right? And the three values of X are set two, one, two, and three, and Y is set two, four, five, and six. We could have also used the following compound data statement, okay? So this screen shows how one statement can be used to assign values to the two attributes simultaneously. So in this case, each row 
assigns different values to the x and y pair, right? Okay, then next is about set looping functions. The set looping function allows you to iterate through all the members of a set to perform some operation. And there are four set looping functions in Lingo. At four is used to generate constraints over members of a set. And sum is probably the most frequently used set looping functions in Lingo. It computes the sum of an expression over all members of a set, okay? And at mean computes the minimum of an expression over all members of a set. Likewise, at max computes the maximum of an expression, okay? Okay, then let's consider another simple example. In this model, each vendor of the vendor set has a corresponding demand. And we could sum up the values of the demand attribute by adding this expression after the end data statement. The corresponding mass formulation would look like this. Total demand equals sum over j equals one zero five demand sub j. Okay. So this is nineteen, right? Which is five plus one plus three plus four plus six to come up with nineteen. Is that right? Here, because the primitive set vendors contains only five members identi identified by V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5, subscript J can take the values from one to five. Is that right? Next, let's suppose we want to sum the first three elements of the attribute demand. In this case, we can use a conditional qualifier on the set index to accomplish this. That is, we just add J sharp LE sharp three, which means J is less than or equal to three. What does it mean, right? Okay, now then, I'm sorry? Yeah, one, two, three, right? So J should take the value of one, two, and three, right? Now Ringo sum up the first three terms in demand, omitting the fourth and the fifth term for a total sum of five plus one plus three becomes nine, right? And the corresponding mass formulation would be like this. Simply, let's say demand three equals sum over j equals one to three at this time, right? And demand j, which becomes five plus one plus three equals nine. Okay, and then the at min and at max functions are used to find the minimum, the maximum of an expression of the members of the set, is that right? So to find the minimum and the maximum demand, we just need to add these two expressions right after the end data statement, right? 
So in either case, when you solve this model, lingo returns the expected minimum and the maximum demand, which is one and six, respectively. Is that right? Next, just for the illustration purpose, suppose we want to compute the, man, the minimum and the maximum values of the first three elements of demand. So what we need to do is to add this conditional qualifier. J is less than or equals to three, like this, right? Of course, when you solve this model, lingo returns the minimum and maximum demand, which is one and five, right, respectively. And to illustrate the use of at four, let's consider the following set definition. Now we have a primitive set of four trucks, right, with a single whole attribute. If a whole is used to denote the amount the truck holds, then we can use at four function to limit the amount hold by each truck to 2,500 pounds with this expression, okay? And actually, you can view the constraints generated by Lingo. Uh, I will show you later uh, how to do this, okay? Anyhow, using that feature, you can see the Lingo generates the following four constraints. Uh, is that? Hall and Ford is less than equals 2,500. Hall GM is less than equals 2,500. Likewise, Hall Toyota less than equals. 2,500. And lastly, all and less than equals 2,500. Okay. And probably when you deal with larger models you will encounter the need to loop over a set within another set looping function, okay? When one set looping function is used within the scope of another, we call it nesting, okay? So in this example, uh, for each vendor, we sum up the shipments going from all the, wire, all the warehouses to the vendor and set the quantity equal to the vendor's demand. Then in this case, we have nested an at sum function within an at four function, right? And the corresponding mass formulation will look like this. Four or J values sum over I Volume IJ equals demand J, okay? And just to let you know that at sum and at max and x and mean can be nested within any set looping functions, okay? On the other hand, at four functions may only be nested within other at four functions. And the last time, I said both Lindo and Lingo assumes all the variables used in a model are assumed uh, to be non-negative. 
and continuous, unless otherwise specified, right? And like it says, Lingo's four variable domain functions can be used to override this default domain for a given variables. And these variable domain functions are at gene for any positive integer values and at bin uh, any binary values or at free for any positive or negative real values and at b and d which means any values within the specified bounds, okay? Okay, then now let's reconsider the chicken feed problem that we have discussed last time. So in this example, a farm manufactures chicken feed by mixing three different ingredients, right? And each ingredient contains four key nutrients which are protein, fat, vitamin A's, and vitamin B's. And because the primary decision is how much of each ingredient should be included in mixture, last time we defined X variables like this, right? And our objective function is to minimize the total cost. So it can be expressed like this. And the first constraint that we have considered is protein restriction which means each kilogram of feed must contain at least 35 grams of protein, right? Next is about the fat constraints and vitamin A and vitamin B constraints, right? And because the total weight of mixture should be one kilogram, we've added this constraint x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1, right? And lastly, we've added the sign restriction for each variable because each ingredient included in mixture cannot be negative value. So finally, this is the complete RP formulation for this chicken feed problem, which includes objective function and constraint sets including non-negativity restrictions. Okay, now then let's build up a corresponding lingo sets model based on this uh, complete LP formulation, okay? Uh, then let me open the lingo. Oh, it's too, too small, right? Okay. Let me see how, how could enlarge the font size. Options, maybe. Oh. Uh, yes, no, no, it's, it's about the solvers. No. Hold on. Let me see. Oh, let me try this way. I'm not sure whether this works. So. Very, very small. I mean, very large font from here. And copy and paste. I'm sure. Hope it does work. Okay. Oh. Is that viewable, right? Let me see. Oh, okay. It does work. Okay, 
So based on our LP, complete LP formulation, we can build up lingo sets. So first, we define three types of ingredients, okay? We can do this in sets section. And lingo start with mother, right? And let's say sets, cotton. And let's say ingredient. There are three types of ingredients, right? So one that are three, or I believe one comma two comma three does work, okay? We usually use one that are three. Either is fine. And after colon, And it is associated with four key nutrients, right? Those are the protein, fat, and vitamin A, and vitamin B. So after colon, you need to specify those four key nutrients, okay? So let's say protein, comma, Fat, comma, vitamin A, vitamin B, and the cost of each ingredient. And with each type of ingredient, ingredient we associate an X variable, right? Which equals the kilogram of each ingredient, ingredient included in mixture. So X could be another attribute for the ingredient set, okay? So in that case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six attributes for ingredient sets, okay? And this line should be end with semicolon, right? And we can finalize the sets section with and sets, right? So the set is given the set name, ingredient, and contains three members, which is identified by one, two, and three, right? And the attributes for each members are called protein, fat, vitamin A, vitamin B, cost, and X, right? So is this a primitive set or the derived set? No, it's the primitive set, right? It's not a derived set because it does not derive its members from other pre-existing sets, right? Yeah. So this is the primitive set. Okay, now let's work with data sections, okay? So data section starts with data, right? And colon, enter. And we can input the given data values for protein, fat, vitamin A, vitamin B, and the cost for each ingredient, right? So let me put those values. So protein equals 25, 45, and 32, and semicolon. Fat equals 11, 10, and 7. And again, semicolon, right? 
And vitamin A equals 235, 160, and 190. And semicolon. Likewise, vitamin B is 12, 6, 10. And semicolon. And lastly, the cost for each ingredient would be 0 0.55, 0 0.42, 0 0.38, right? And semicolon. And we can finalize the data section with the keyword and data, right? Next, we can create the objective function, right? What is our objective function? In mathematical notation, we want to minimize the total cost, right? Sum over i equal to 1 to 3, because we have three ingredients, right? C sub i times x sub i. Actually, we've used cost, right, instead of C. Cost sub i times x sub i. And of course, this i stands for the ingredients, right? So, this notation would be transformed to lingo input like this. Min equals add sum, right? That is the summation, right? And parentheses, open parentheses, and because in that case, I represents the ingredient, right? We need to specify the same name first, which is ingredient, right? In gradient, and parenthesis, the subscript I, and close the parenthesis, right? And then, put the colon, then just put this, which is cost subscript i times x subscript i. And this parenthesis should be closed now, right? And semicolon, okay? So I'm going to put this in our input section. So our objective is to minimize sum over ingredient i colon cost i times xi. And we can close the parentheses, right? And semicolon. So we've done the objective function right now. Next, we need to consider each constraint one by one, right? Sorry, what is the name? X. X, you know. Because I, 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 I didn't. Mm -hmm. What is the name? Actually, where they define the attributes, you have X. Right. Yeah. So but X is the decision variable, right? Actually. Um, Just the, the kilogram of each ingredient, right? 
but of course, that's the attribute for the ingredient sets, right? Okay. Which means the subscript of X follows the same demand dimension as in ingredient. Okay, what is our first constraint? Okay. Okay, first constraint was the protein constraint, right? So it's like sum over i equals one to three to protein sub i times x i should be greater than equals that thirty five, right? Okay. So in a lingo, it should be something like this. Again, we should use as sum, right? And then again we need to specify the same name. Ingredient I and colon, right? And put this description here, which is protein sub i times x sub i, right? And we can close this parenthesis right now because this subscript i will not be used anymore, right? So we can close this parenthesis right now. And then this is greater than equals 35. And with semicolon, okay? So let me put this in our input. Add some ingredient I colon protein I times X I and close the parenthesis greater than equals thirty five and semicolon. Is that difficult to see? It's too big? Is that okay? Maybe I can increase me a little bit, 32. Let me copy and paste it here. Hopefully it does work better. So likewise, we can have the fat constraint start with as some right? ingredient I colon oops and fat I times X I and we move this. So it's better to see. And close the parenthesis. This is greater than equals eight. Right? And colon, no, semicolon. 
and vitamin A constraint has some ingredient I colon vitamin A I times Xi and close the parenthesis greater than equals uh, so greater than equals 180, right? Okay. I think we have missed another constraint for fat, right? There is a maximum yeah. right, limit. So it's going to be fat i times xi is less than equals what value is a 10, right? Yeah. So my colon. And next is about vitamin B, right? Uh oh. Weapon. Okay. Have to recopy and paste it here. Add some ingredient I vitamin B times Xi, which is greater than equals nine, right? And the total weight constraint, which is sum over ingredient I X of I equals one, right? That's it. And we can end the lingo program with end mark here. And as I said earlier today, actually you can view the actual constraint generated by Lingo. So just go to the Lingo menu. If you choose generate, and then display model, okay? Let me repeat again. So under the Lingo menu, if you choose generate, and then display model, then you can see the actual constraint like this. Isn't it cool, right? It's hard to see because it's small size font, but you can try this later on, okay? So go to Lingo model, Lingo menu, and choose generate and display model, okay? Then you will see what do you build up? Of course, if you want to solve the problem, then just press this key, right? Press this button. Then Lingo solve the problem right away. So in our case, the objective value, optimal objective value is 0.39 A6. And our Decision variables is like this, right? X1 value is 0.45, X2 is 0.27, X3 is 0.68, and so on. Any questions? Well, then this is all for today. And next time, I will give you more examples 
about lingo sets programming. Okay. Okay, then I will see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.